3D printer slicers continue to lead innovation, and Orca Slicer's new release is no exception. Today, we're going to test out some great new features to enhance your 3D printing experience. Because they're open source and therefore there's a lot of input from the community, Slicer software for 3D printing continues to get better and better. Orca Slicer is currently preparing for its version 2.3.1 release, and they've done a great job of documenting exactly what the new features are. But in this video, I'm going to try them out firsthand and share with you the results, so you can see the pros and cons and work out which ones you'd like to give a go. The first improvement that we're looking at is a lot more control over the direction of sparse infill. And to access most of the features from this video, in Orca Slicer, we need to toggle Advanced to On. In our Strength section, under Infill, we always had control over the direction. Looking inside here, this is a base angle of 30 degrees. Here is 0 degrees, which is parallel with the perimeters. And the default of 45 degrees. But you'll notice that the whole way through, the infill faces the same direction. And that's where our new Sparse Infill Rotation template comes in. We have a field that we can fill out and doing so is best done after reading the wiki. And we can get to this by clicking the name. This is a long page and can seem daunting at first. But if you remember that our aim is to alter the direction of the infill throughout the print and we stick to the examples and notation, we should be able to get a good result. The first style we'll try is a comma separated list. Here we have the default option with nothing filled in for rectilinear. And here is the result with 0, 0,45. For half of the layers, the infill is simply horizontal or 0 degrees, and for the other half of the layers, it's slanted at 45 degrees, creating this diamond pattern. So if we add 135 as a third parameter, we can see that we start with 0, 45 degrees, 135 degrees, and then this repeats back and forth as per the instruction. The next setting, and my favorite, is to use plus or minus to rotate the infill the same amount for each layer. So I simply went for plus one to see it change over time throughout the print. It starts at one degree, the next layer prints at two, then three, then four, and so forth until we get this mesmerizing pattern as the infill heads towards the top. And we can see in this real life time lapse, the infill changing by one degree for each layer, which gives the appearance of the insides being animated throughout the print. Of course, this works with other options besides the default rectilinear. Something like gyroid, which already looked mesmerizing during a print preview, looks even crazier now during an animated preview. This is a cool novelty, but what's an actual application for this? Well, here is a rather strange object that I've designed to illustrate a point. So let's say I want to save filament by having only 2% infill, but therefore want to maximize strength by having the infill come at a 45 degree angle across each of these sections. After some experimentation, this is what I ended up with. 45 hash 38% which sets the base infill for the first 38% of the model at 45 degrees, comma, 0, hash 31%, which for the next 31% of the model sets the base angle at 0, and then minus 30, hash 31%, which changes the angle once again to minus 30 for the remainder. Let's preview the G-code and recall that our aim was to have the infill at 45 degrees relative to the external pointed sections. And that's exactly what we've achieved here, which should give us a good mix between time saving and strength. This is a random demonstration, and most people won't need to play with this, but that certain print where you need it just right, it's good to have this option. So what are the downsides? Well, when you rotate the infill, every time there's a change in direction, the new piece of infill won't necessarily be sitting properly on top of the old one. And that means in some places, the infill is going to be quite weak. If you can see gaps in the G-code preview, you're definitely going to have them in real life. Our next feature is a lot easier to understand and I think a lot more people will be able to use it. The strongest part of our 3D prints are the perimeters because we can thicken them with multiple layers touching each other. But until now for our infill, it's always been a single extrusion no matter what the pattern was. So if we wanted to up strength, we would need to up this sparse infill percentage and that would increase the density of the pattern, but they were still made from individual extrusions. A new and very welcome setting is called fill multi-line. It defaults to one, but we can up this, just like our perimeters, to as many as we want. I'm going to up it to five and lower my overall sparse infill percentage down from 15 to five as well. If we examine our new infill, we can see that we have five extrusions making it up, and that's going to be a lot more rigid. For comparison, this print with default settings was going to be just under three hours. 
but the alternative version lowers that down to an hour and 41. Even a better compromise of 10% and a film multi-line of 3 takes 40 minutes off the print and should be very strong. And we can demonstrate this by revisiting our previous example with the rotating infill. This example has a multi-line fill value of 3, and we can see side by side that despite the density being much lower, the printed infill is significantly stronger. And again, this works with multiple patterns, here you're seeing gyroid with a multi-line fill of 3. I don't have the apparatus to test the best compromise between density and fill multi-line, but the fact that we have this option is very promising. So this next one was added on top of all the other features in 231 Beta, and it allows us to add additional solid infill mid-print, which is a handy tool for strength and also for print quality in certain situations. For this one, we're going to come to the Strength tab, make sure we have Advanced ticked, and scroll all the way down to the bottom under the Advanced section, and it's called Insert Solid Layers. Once again, if we click on the setting name, we'll be taken to the wiki with a visual demonstration and some examples we can use. Here I have a simple cylinder, and if we slice it normally, we can see that at the bottom we have solid layers, sparse infill the whole way through the middle, followed by solid layers on top. But what if I want to segment this model with additional solid layers? Let's try 50 hash 2 and re-slice. From the outside it looks the same, but when we go through the preview, we can see every 50 layers, we get two additional solid layers, breaking up the sparse infill and increasing strength. Let's lower our sparse infill density so we can better see what's happening, and then send this one to the printer. And the time lapse confirms what we were asking, an evenly spaced pair of solid layers to add strength by breaking up the sparse infill but we can be more targeted with our application of solid layers, and here's a test piece to demonstrate just that. Here is the file sliced in Cura, which sits outside of the Prusa Slicer family of software. Lower on, we have sparse infill, but then all of a sudden, it's trying to build the base of our two cylinder pockets on top, and despite Cura adding a little bit of additional scaffolding, sections of this are going to be unsupported. The same thing happens as we head higher up, some additional support extrusions are laid down, but then the base of our pocket is built on top of that, and it's going to be hard to get this precise. Here's an enormous print to show this problem. At the base of any new section, there was basically empty infill underneath, so there's little gaps in the top surface until the printer can recover. In Orca Slicer and Prusa Slicer, there's actually a little bit more scaffolding laid down, so the base of the feature isn't built in midair. But now we have the control to insert solid layers wherever we want. For this example, we can scroll through the preview and find the point where we'd like to add extra solid layers, and then simply list them separated by a comma to add them at this height. Now when I slice the model at layer 72, it's completely solid, which should be a little bit more stable, and the same if we come down to layer 22, and both of these should be a little more stable for laying those features on top of. There is, however, a downside that can be tuned out, which you might have spotted in the time lapse. Similar to what we see in the infamous Benchy bow line, the transition from sparse infill to a solid layer changes things enough that we can see it on the exterior walls. On my cylinder example, this exhibits a Z banding, which you can see as well as feel, but at least on my functional part test, it's a lot more subtle. Visible for the higher one, but almost invisible for the lower one. Next up, some new options in terms of applying fuzzy skin. The first is fuzzy skin painting, and we have this new button found up the top called paint on fuzzy skin. This works just like support or seam painting, set your brush size and then paint onto the model where you'd like the fuzzy skin to be applied. Now at this stage, under fuzzy skin, there's no option to say only where painted, we have to leave it on none. But when we slice the model, we can see that it has in fact been applied where we painted and we can verify this by printing an actual test piece. We also have some new options for how we generate our fuzzy skin pattern. The default option has always been displacement, where the outer extrusions deviate to create the rough effect, using our point distance and thickness as inspiration. However, in this version, we have a new option for extrusion-based fuzzy skin. As the preview shows, the extrusion path does not really deviate, but if we set our preview to line width, we can see that the fuzzy skin is achieved by fluctuating that instead. Besides displacement and extrusion, we have an option to combine the two. So I took the chance to print some sequentially back to back to make a comparison. Here we have the three options starting with the classic displacement fuzzy skin. If you've used fuzzy skin before, this is how it would look. In the center, we have the version that varies flow instead, and I think you'll agree that it's a lot more subtle than the standard version. And then on the right, we have the combined version, which has a similar texture to the original version, but looks a little bit smoother overall. 
Finally, something I never play with before are these various noise types. And selecting any of them besides classic will make the fuzzy skin pattern more irregular, simulating something like stone. Our example on the left is the billow pattern. And although we haven't changed the point distance or skin thickness, this texture appears rougher than the classic pattern. The right hand bunny has the Voronoi pattern, which is even more irregular, giving a mottled appearance. Combine these fuzzy skin patterns with some marble filament and we get something that really looks like natural stone, at least until you pick it up and see how light it is. Our next addition are some new calibration tests that are very handy for those tuning input shaping without an accelerometer. Previously, you had to print a test tower to induce ringing and then measure the distance between the artifacts on the surface of the print. Following that, you did some calculations based on the distance between the artifacts as well as the print speed and this would spit out the numbers you needed to save to the firmware. This new test is a lot easier and goes in two stages, starting with the input shaping frequency. We have two towers to choose from and we input a frequency range and I found the standard values to be spot on. Finally, we have the damping. You can either set this to zero or I set mine to 0.1, which was the value already saved in the printer. Orca Slicer will then produce a tower with nothing visually apparent in the G-code preview but within the G-code are the commands to alter the frequency in either Marlin or Clipper flavor, depending on what your printer is set to in Orca Slicer. So we end up with a tower where the input shaping frequency varies over the height. And naturally some areas will have more or less ringing than others. So you're trying to find the height that has the best compromise and the cleanest surface. Once you've determined that spot for X and Y, you can use some calipers or a ruler to find the vertical height from the base Look inside the G-code, go to that height, and find the frequency that was set for that section. We can now come back and run the second test. Entering our ideal frequency values from the last test, and this time setting a range for the damping start and end. We slice this and print it to produce a second tower, again with a range of rigging on the surface. Once again, for both X and Y, if the values are different, we find the height with the best looking surface, and return to the G-code to retrieve that value. Another welcome addition that works just as well for Clipper and Marlin printers. And in case your firmware doesn't even support input shaping, there's a new setting called Resonance Avoidance. This is found in the Motion Ability section of the printer settings. We need to tick it and then enter a minimum and maximum speed. To determine those speeds, we can come back up to calibration and do the VFA test. This will generate a tower that gets progressively faster and once printed, we can inspect this tower and look for any regions that have stronger VFAs. Partially because it's glossier, but this lower band for me is where the print quality looks the worst and we have a pretty sweet spot in the middle here. Looking at the preview, I want to avoid zero up to around 70. So I can come back up to my printer settings. We can tick the box, enter a low value here and the upper part of the range here. And now the slicer where it can will try to avoid this area that gives the most VFAs. Lucky last is a quality of life feature that lets you remap filament for pre-colored models. Let's say I've imported this three color model. It's a single STL that has been painted. And let's say we wanted to change these colors. We can click on the model, come up to color painting. And previously, if I wanted to replace say the red with purple, I would need to go through and click on all of the sections one at a time. And it looks like this is a quick job, but quite often when you zoom in, you'll see some small sections that haven't quite happened automatically. And this becomes quite a pain to get them all. But now we have a new rewrap filament button. We simply click on the color and then pick our new color that we want to be reassigned in its place. We then click remap to save the change and that's it, we're done in a few seconds. This was not an exhaustive list of all the new features and there might still be more to come that hasn't been announced yet. Thank you to the devs and everyone involved from the community for pushing our hobby forward. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.